So if you have yeah. something to read and react to, it tends to speed things up over just coming up with something from scratch. Now, I know there's people out there that love doing that, and those people will still exist with AI, but I think AI is challenging that, and it's really helping those of us who want to start with something, and that's where it's really increasing in, in helping our process. Yeah, I love what Storyline, you know, again, I'm not a huge fan of Rise, but they're starting with Rise. I love what they're doing with AI because it is that, like, it's the generative content stuff. And, you know, I, I am really curious and excited. They said they're going to lose that in the storyline. I'm curious if that will work or how that will work. Um, because for us, you know, I think where AI stands is going to be much more, if you bring the storyline right now, it's going to be very much just deliver content. And let's test people on it. That's not how we operate, right? So the, the tools and storyline when we're creating e-learning modules, we try to do exactly what we would do for when we were creating live sessions. Let's give them a practice activity that's relevant and meaningful and then give them feedback or prompt reflection or something like that. So it's, you know, I think we're, we're in this fun place because it's like things are just coming out of the market and we're all like, let's play with it. But nobody really knows what this is going to be. So I'm curious what you think. Uh, the end result will be so like in five years what's lnd going to look like because of current industry and the, the changes that are happening i think in five years ai will still be where it is now i don't think it's going to move that quickly you're going to have those i think what you're going to have is all of those early adopters put ai courses out and we're going to see the results of that in the data in five years right so when I've explored AI tools currently, like a lot of them for me end up being just text-based courses. And we know the text-based courses are not necessarily effective, yep. but people are going to throw them out there and they're going to see if they work. Right. And then we're going to have results on that. So, and then too, with that, like you see all of these examples out there of AI courses with AI generated humans. Um, you're able to take your likeness if you want and put it out there. Right. But research tells us that the first five minutes of a course are most impactful. So is that really impactful of a learner's going, if a learner's sitting there watching a course and saying, is this person real or are they fake? Like, I don't even know. Yeah, like you're losing that five minutes of creating relevance for that learner. So I think people, I think there's going to be this wave, right? Everyone's going to be the early adopters for AI. There's going to be those companies out there that we outsource projects to that, that produce AI produce products, but then we see if they're effective or not. And that data is going to be out there. So I think it's going to take about five years for that really to come to fruition. It may be faster than that. I'm not sure, but I think different industries are going to move at different speeds. Um, but I think that's where AI is going to be in five years is we're going to have the data now to see what is effective and it's going to be narrowed down from this just broad playground of tools to something that is more kind of narrowed down to the key players. Um, along with that, I mean, we mentioned earlier VR, AR. I think that will continue to grow. We as a company that, that sells our courses continue to have logistics problems with something like a BR, because how do you supply goggles to people in a remote world now that the workplace tends to be remote? Um, so I think there's still going to be challenges with that. I think AR definitely can be used. We are exploring that with, with a lot of our products now because it is so flexible um, because people can use our personal devices and you can create those anchors within um, things like handouts or things that you can anchor to your computer screen, things like that, that they can use AI off of, or I'm sorry, uh, AR off of. So I think that will continue to grow. I actually see AR growing faster than VR uh, just because of that logistics challenge. But I mean, with that new products come out, I mean, Apple releasing their new VR goggles. I mean, new products come out and could change the industry. Um, That's right. But I think VR, AR continue to grow VR more slowly, but there could be changes within that, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's similar to like, you know, I always like to think back of the changes that happened in call it late nineties, early two thousands, maybe mid two thousands in the learning development field where they were having the same conversations about quote CBT computer based training. Not everybody has a computer. Well, okay, now look now I <laughs> I mean client I, I work with a client and they'll send me a laptop just so I can get access to their VPN. Like it's their 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 network. Like it's it's a thing that it, laptops are just part of everyday work. And and if you think about when that shift happened and how long it took from like the first time organizations were using laptops 
to, I mean, you're right. It was probably about five years before it came like, yeah, we'll just throw these laptops to anybody who wants one. And so it is going to be very interesting. And I think you're right. I think as technology improves, but it's a get, get a gimmicky market because people are going to, you know, we got the goggles now, maybe they create glasses. There's going to be a lot of people or a lot of organizations that are helping products in the market and learning development. People were like, yeah, that's awesome. But it's got to be streamlined. Just like, you know, storyline became the captivate started. And that was like what we all rushed to for e-learning, rapid e-learning authoring tools. And then storyline came on the market, did everything better than what captivate was. And now they're the industry standard. And so I think something like that needs to happen in the field of, I don't even know. It's not really learning development field, but we're going to, whatever is most commonplace, we're going to be able to push on it. And it's also similar and I'm curious your thoughts and maybe you don't have any, but like the transition of Flash. Remember how important Flash was? I thought about that as I was thinking about this this podcast. So like the, you had, right, so you had in the late 90s or early 2000s video-based training that was just, here's this videotape, sit and watch it. Or here's this DVD, sit and watch it. Flash came around. And then you had your Flash programmers who could do some interactions. So now you could start to click on things. So it created this new evolution of, of that, right? And just along with that, you had the the implementation of Google and different tools that you can now have information readily available to you. Um, so it was really the first like move from something that was stagnant to just a stagnant experience to something you could actually interact with and, and, and create activities for. And to your point, like then Captivate came around, Storyline came around. So that was like a phase three evolution. Then Flash died. All those Flash developers had to learn new skills or they were going to be left behind. And now I think you and I are in the same spot. So we know Storyline, we know Captivate, we know all those development tools that were huge in the 2000s and 2010s. Now what's the next evolution of that? Those tools are probably going to evolve. We know that some of them, at least some of them are going to evolve to include AI. Yep. But what are the new tools that are going to come to the market that are going to take over and and, and possibly challenge a Storyline or, or a Captivate to be the main player? We don't know. Yeah, well, you see a lot of like in VR. One thing I find interesting, I don't know if you have any insight into this, is like, Storyline has never gone down the VR path, really. They, they've kind of gave a lip service a little bit, but never have they done anything in VR. Why, any ideas why? Like, what's your insight to that? No idea why. I know I've seen a lot of examples of VR used that's not, I'll say, true VR because you don't necessarily need the goggles. And I think that's something that's adaptive just based on the audience. So not everyone has VR goggles, so you might just create a video out there where you can just move it around and pan it and things like that. Um but I think I think VR is still a growing a growing area. There's a very niche use application of VR, and I hope it doesn't change for the next five years to VR becoming a gimmick, because VR has a really good implementation when it is someone who wants to tactfully do something. So you want to teach an electrician how to wire a fuse panel, or you want to teach teach a manufacturing engineer how to work a product line. Uh, yep. It is a very very niche use in that. And I know there's tools out there now where you can create VR. And I've seen examples of courses where people use VR in a way that is just gimmicky. I, I use the word gimmicky, but um, it's just something cool to say, hey, we have a VR experience in this course. That's so um, I hope well, to, go that to, do it real, to do it the way you need to do it, it's expensive. Like to get the actual video, a VR video of somebody doing the let's what you need in order to create the module, then it costs money. And so people do the gimmicky piece. Yeah. And there's a logistic end to it. Like I said, I mean, you got to have all the goggles and things like that. So the development may not cost money. I mean, I've talked to different uh, outsourcing companies where it's not that expensive to have it developed, sure. but then the logistics piece, you have to buy all the goggle sets if, if you're supplying them yourself or things like that. So the operations side of it tends to be a challenge and more expensive. Yeah, and so we have, you know, this is a topic which, you know, when you and I talked last time, I just wanted to bring you on the podcast because it's, I think our audience will, will like it, but it, they'll like it because it's what we're all dealing with, right? We, we're going to have to figure this out. Uh, if you want to be in the learning development field, so let me just kind of back up slightly uh, because the learning development field is inundated with people who are not really learning development people, right? Because what happened was people were graphic designers and they saw this. $380 billion industry. And they said, Hey, I want to go. They're using similar tools to what I'm doing. I want to go make some money in this giant industry. And so these, you know, when we talk about quote, L and D professionals, 
I put that in major quotes because some of them just are graphic design. But for us truly, and, and they're going to go away. Like those folks will just kind of dissipate and they're not going to be here. So I do think there'll be even a staffing shift in, because of these changes. But those who really care about people learning, we're going to have to figure this out. What tools are we going to use? How does this change our process? But the answers simply aren't there yet. So, I, you know, I've got clients who are starting to ask, but no one really asked for any of this pop this this stuff that's happening right now the technologies that exist right now so yeah i hear it i hear it people are asking about it from, from my my area but some of it tends to be gimmicky because like i said we sell our training so people want the vr because it is the cool new thing it's but at yeah. a core i mean you mentioned process earlier and how does it change process it doesn't change our process right as instructional designers we need to learn our audience we need to focus on what is the outcome of this course it's just the difference now is you have to be agile as an instructional designer to say the tools I have in my toolbox are not necessarily the ones I need to create this experience to achieve these outcomes because there are better tools out there now and I need to be agile in my own learning and agile in my process to incorporate those new tools. Um, yeah. Whether it be AI or just something out there that produces a different kind of video or, or something like that that is a more effective use of what I'm trying to do to achieve those outcomes for this audience. And, and but. I mean, at a core instructional design level, it doesn't change that we need to know our audience. We need to know what the outcomes are. We need to know our enabling objectives. Um, and we need to use those things to build an effective experience for our students. Yep. Very cool. One final question before we wrap up. You know, as you think about the fact that we just got to figure this out, uh, what's one thing you would recommend to L&D professionals to begin their journey into the future of learning? I think you kind of hit it too. Like you just have to explore. There's so many things out there. And I find myself, if I'm not exploring every day and seeing a new tool or looking at what this does or that does, you feel like you fall behind. I mean, gone are the days of just looking at e-learning heroes for storyline to see what new examples are out there. There's just all these new things out there. And, and with that, and I'm just talking e-learning development tools, but there's learning management systems now that are incorporating AI and, and ways to create learning and journeys that are different than we're used to in the past. I mean, my experience being a learning admin before it was just, you put everything in a course and you're done or a learning path and you're done. Now you can create learning paths that go over time, um, or things that trickle out learning based on someone who has taken a course. Um, or if you took course a, now you get course B or you get activity C, like you can create all these different logics to create these different journeys. And I think the people that are going to excel in the learning and development field, are they going to be the ones that explore that and see the, the, the ways that that benefits the learners. And those are going to be the ones that really excel in the next five years in the future of L&D. Um, those who are stuck in their ways, I mean, this happens with every profession, right? Those who don't want to upskill and don't want to embrace the new are going to be stuck and are not going to excel as much as those who are going to, to go out there and see what's new and, and how they can use it. So my advice to L&D professionals to begin their journey, just don't be afraid to upskill, be flexible, be agile, but again, you are an instructional designer. You are a learning professional. Focus on the outcomes. Focus on your audience. That doesn't change. But the way that we produce those learning experiences may, and that's where the flexibility and the agile nature needs to come in. Mike, it is always a pleasure to talk to you about learning and development. And this was a fun one because we kind of brought the rest of the world into our uh, Starbucks or, our, I'm sorry, Panera lunches that we, we do. So this is I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you were able to offer this insight. And I think it's, it, you know, we're in this place of um, learning together. And so I think some of these conversations need to continue to happen. And I, I hope that the folks share their insights and ideas so that we can all kind of learn together. So thank yeah, you. I think, here. And I, I think this podcast is a representative of where the industry is, right? Because it's hard to talk about all these things happening in 10 minutes. <laughs> That's right. That's There's right. Yeah. happening. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and, uh, yeah, it, again, a ton of fun. I appreciate you being here. Appreciate your insight. Um, but you're right. There's so much more to talk about. So I look forward to this future conversation too. Um, Thanks for having me. It was nice being here.